sort of cool. I feel like I have my own little talk show up here. I sort of move sets, and <laughs> then we'd show a little video about you. It's so great. Um, how are you doing? I'm well, thank you. Good. It's nice to see you here. Good you to know, be here. We talked a couple years ago in Berlin, shortly after you had bought this little football club um, called Chelsea. And it's been an interesting intervening couple of years. I want to talk about your entire sports portfolio, but I think there might be a run on the stage if I didn't start by asking you uh, about Chelsea. And in the context of, of what you've been working on in sports over the last 10, 20 years, what's been the biggest lesson? What's been the biggest thing you've taken away from the last two years when it comes to Chelsea? Well, I think the number one thing is you got to be patient. You know, I think you're putting something together and you're expecting it to come together really quickly. And the reality is that anything really good takes a little bit of time. And so I think patience was always a thought. I mean, when we bought the Dodgers, you know, and we started the season in 2013, the team basically started 15 and 25. Yeah. And, you know, we were struggling, you know, but we kind of just kept sticking to the plan and, you know, we knew that the plan, or we believed the plan was the right plan at the time. Uh, and, you know, we went through a, a similar thing with, with Chelsea. You know, and you got to have the resolve to kind of not hear all the noise going on around you. And at the same time, you know, remain patient and, and, patient and committed to the plan. And you feel good about your plan. I mean, the, listen, on the pitch, it's been a great little run. I mean, since Boxing Day, we're the fourth best team in the Premier League. Right. You know, so when you look at, you know, what, what's going on, you know, it feels better and better. And so how does that influence, I mean, winning obviously help, floats all boats in, in, in a lot of ways. What's the next business decision you feel like you need to make with your partners at, at CFC? Well, long term, what we're working on is what's the stadium plan yeah. going to be? You know, I think we've got, you know, the really unique spot in London. You know, so many people can walk to come to a Chelsea game. And, you know, we're basically in the heart of West London. But, you know, we only have a stadium that seats about 40,000. Mm -hmm. And to be able to upgrade the quality of the stadium uh, and the size of the stadium, you know, is really a, a priority for us over the course of the next decade. Right. And you think that'll start pretty soon? I mean, it's already starting, yeah, right? But, you know, you have to have, you know, a lot of conversations right. with a lot of constituencies because, you know, you're in the middle of London. Right. And, you know, I think the, the, the good news is you're in the middle of London, but the bad news is you're in the middle of London. Right. And so as we, as we zoom out a little bit, I mean, it's sort of fascinating. We saw a little bit of it in the video. You think about the Dodgers, the Lakers, Chelsea, I mean, these are three, you know, clearly, you know, as an American, certainly the Dodgers and the Lakers, you know, hit, hit bigger in, in terms of their cultural um, import. What are the lessons you take from those two franchises? Maybe we, let's talk about the Dodgers uh, for a second, because, you know, as you say, first, first blush, tough little run. Now you have arguably the most exciting player maybe to play the game in this century in, in Shohei Otani. Um, how do you maximize him as, <laughs> as an asset, I guess, since we are talking business? Well, I think just to put it in context, like last year, the Rangers played the Diamondbacks in the World Series. And in the aggregate, there was 45 million people that watched that series. When we announced the Otani signing, at his press conference, there were 70 million people that watched. Wow. When we were in Korea starting the season, the amount of fandom, you know, anytime you go in Tokyo, you know, you see Otani. The amount of people who are following, I mean, just last night when he hit a home run, he's now batting 361, so he's the number one batter in the league. And he's hit, you know, the second most home runs. And last night when he hit a home run against the San Francisco Giants, the amount of cheering for him you know, it was almost something that you never hear when the Dodgers are in San Francisco. Right. And that's because people travel to see him. I mean, he is a, you know, every, every city, you know, you have this new fan base that's really focused on 
all things Otani. Right. And so what does that mean for, for the franchise and what are the, the business decisions that you make and, and how does that influence other decisions you make having this person? I mean, especially the structure of the deal allows for more spending in the interim, right? In, in terms of the way you structured his massive um, contract, right? Well, I mean, obviously he was um, excited about that, yeah, right? Because what he really wanted from us was a commitment to win on, on the field. And, you know, for people who don't know, basically it was the largest sports contract, you know, in the world. The notional amount was 700 million. And you know, it's a 10 year playing contract with a 20 year payout. So for the first 10 years, he makes $2 million a year. And for years 11 through 20, he made $68 million a year. Right? So basically, when you think about what the average annual value of that is, it's roughly $44 million a year. And he did that because he wanted us to be able to invest in the team and win now. So that allowed us to go get you know, a couple other pitchers uh, because we had the financial flexibility to do it. You know, but obviously you've got you know, a pitcher and a hitter in Otani. So you've got a top five hitter in the world, you've got a top five pitcher in the world, and you get an extra roster spot out of it. Right. Right. So, you know, most people are playing with 25 people, you know, we're playing with 26. Right. And so as you think about, you know, the lessons of, of the Dodgers, how do you apply that? I mean, that, whether it's the long-term investment thesis, like how does that play out across the rest of the portfolio? Well, the first thing I think, you know, from, from our point of view, you know, we believe the brands really matter. And, you know, if you look at the, the, the Dodgers, you know, in the U.S., it's a giant brand. You know, they were the first team to have an African-American player in Jackie Robinson. And then, of course, I would argue that the Lakers in the 80s with the Celtics really built the NBA. Mm -hmm. You know, both the Lakers and the Celtics each have 17 titles. So, you know, those are the two dominant teams. And back in the 80s, when the NBA was really kind of getting going, you know, because before that, there was questions whether the NBA would survive. Yeah. And you had Magic Johnson versus Larry Bird, still the most watched uh, NCAA finals game in the history of, you know, NCAA uh, basketball, college basketball. Um, and those two guys came into the league at the right time, you know, and really built both brands. Right. And so I think from our perspective, it's really hard to recreate a brand. It's really hard to extend a brand, um, you know, from one level into another level. Uh, so, you know, the, the brands that are Lakers and Dodgers and Chelsea, they're global brands. Right. You know, and, and that's just really hard to replicate. And so what do you need to do to further the Chelsea global brand? Because, you know, obviously it is a global brand, but probably trails some of its rivals in, in, in the EPL. Where do you need to invest there to ensure that it, it continues to grow? Well, I think, as you said earlier, you know, winning is clearly the most important thing. Um, you know, so we're focused on winning. The second thing is having what we think is a really young and exciting team. Right. You know, that's going to be around together for a long time. Because if you look at franchises that, you know, dominate for periods of time, it's because they have real stability, real stability in the team, you know, real stability in the front office, real stability in, you know, the, 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 the coaching. So, you know, to be able to lay the groundwork, to be able to start with the stability on the team, you know, by having a young team that has, you know, longer than average contracts, um, you know, and the reality is in, in, in European football, you know, if you're a seven-year contract, the way we look at that is really it's a five-year contract, mm -hmm. right? Because, you know, the, the, the capitalization of the transfer value is such that you're never going to let a contract expire down to the last year. Right. You're either going to extend the contract or you're going to figure out, you know, what's next, uh, you know, for, for that player. Um, so, you know, when we were looking at that, we're thinking a lot about how do we have stability, how do we have a core, and, you know, the Dodgers are the same thing. Right now, if you look at our top three players in the lineup, right, you've got Mookie Betts, who, you know, we signed to a 10-year contract. 
We've got Shohei Itani batting second, who is also on a 10-year contract. And we got Freddie Freeman, who's on an eight-year contract. So, you know, the, the duration that we have for those guys to develop together, uh, you know, is, is, is really what we think makes, you know, the, the, the potential. Obviously, it doesn't guarantee anything. Right. But it's laying the framework for the foundation for something that has the ability to come together as it, you know, figures itself out. Right. And is that a story that you feel like you're, that is starting to get through on, on the Chelsea side? Because, I mean, let's be honest, you've taken a lot of heat. And I know you probably isolate yourself from, from a lot of the noise, but like for the, for the spending. But I you see, look that's at that the other thing investment. I don't think, right? right? I mean, when people talk about spending, I mean, the way I think about it is we're investing. Mm -hmm. And when we have, you know, a, a collection of players, and really, those players continue to hold their value. Right. Right. So it's not as if we're, you know, kind of writing off the money, right. the investment. Right. So, you know, what we're thinking about is what does it really cost to finance that portfolio of players? Yeah. Right. So, you know, because of course, you know, some players will go up in value and some players will go down in value. But, you know, I would argue that, you know, the investments that we've made, you know, have continued to, as a balance, continue to hold their value. And really, therefore, you know, we're not spending the money, you know, we're investing the money. And really, we're just thinking about the cost of carry. Yeah. You know, what's it cost to, to carry that portfolio of players that are obviously so valuable? I, I want to widen the aperture even more and, and still stay on the, in this topic to talk about media, because you have assets there as well, as well through, through Eldridge, whether it's, you know, with Rolling Stone, Golden Globes, a24, obviously, in, in the movie business, um, Cirque du Soleil, you understand the media world. The media world is part of the intrinsic value. We just spent a lot of time talking about this on the panel in sports. How do you see the media element of this evolving in the near term? We've got an NBA, you know, media rights deal that's going to be announced probably any day now. What happens next with media as it relates to sports and the value of sports? So, right, if you think about how you break apart the value of a club or a team, right, to, you, you have everything that goes on site, right? You've got the tickets, the merch, the hospitality, you know, the food and beverage, the sponsorship inside of the actual facility. And then, you know, the media value is the glow, right, that comes out of the facility, whether it's an arena or a stadium or whatever it is. And then you think about, okay, well, how do I expand, expand and extend that glow, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, I think obviously, you know, the, the thing that really is driving these is that there's now trillion dollar balance sheets or trillion dollar market value companies that have gotten involved, right? So it used to be you would have kind of, you know, the broadcasters thinking about it. Now you've got, you know, Amazon, Google, Apple, that are all playing in the game. And you look at them and together, they're probably worth, I don't know, $6 trillion or right. something, $5 trillion. And not to right? mention Netflix, who's probably around the hoop. Yeah, and, but, and Netflix is, you know, it's a big company. Yeah. But compared to those guys, right. it's, a, it's, it's really not so big, <laughs> right. right? But it's, I think, probably a $300 billion market yeah. cap. Right. right. And yeah, now they're throwing their, 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 their hat in the ring, you know, because they understand, you know, that people want to watch this stuff. And, you know, there's very few things that people adjust their calendar for, right? So, and sports are probably it. Right. Maybe some award shows, but certainly sports. Right. And if you look at, you know, Major League Baseball, it, it is a tale of the haves and have-nots in many ways when it comes to media. The Dodgers, I mean, that was a key part of your investment thesis, I believe, when, when you bought the Dodgers is the sort of implicit value in, on the media side, correct? I mean, the, you know, 100%. Yeah. I mean, when we, when we bought the club, it was 2012, and the media rights were coming up for renewal in 2013, right? So, you know, and, and how we valued that was a real appreciation for what we thought the media rights were, right? And, you know, MLB is even more complicated, right? Because you've got the, the cable system, you know, back then it's now kind of crumbling a little bit, but you have the cable system, that would then go into the RSN, and then the dollars in the RSN would go into the team, 
right? And the dollars that would stay at the RSN were not subject to revenue sharing. Right. So, you know, the revenue sharing is really what goes on at the team, but not at the RSN. So we ended up getting $8.4 billion over 25 years that went from the cable companies into the RSN, and we only had to invest $3 billion from the RSN into the team. Right. Roughly, rough math. Right. Right. So that was absolutely part of the strategy. And, you know, the revenue sharing was based on the $3 billion, roughly, that was coming from the RSN into the team, you know, and everything that stayed in the RSN, and we owned 100% of the RSN. And so does, does the same upside exist as you look at Chelsea and the EPL and soccer more globally? Does the same upside exist on the, for media, you think, for soccer? Football. Football, yeah. I think that you know, it's, <laughs> Thank it's you. hard to be here and call it soccer. <laughs> I know. But it's the, embarrassing. Uh, it's embarrassing for me. But the, um, I mean, I think there's, there's, there's no bigger sport in the world right. in terms of demand, right? And, you know, you go anywhere in the world and people know the top football clubs. And, you know, even in the U.S., you know, I think the, the time slots that the Premier League has you know, in the U.S. on Saturday and Sunday doesn't really compete with anything. Right. Right. And obviously the NFL is trying to figure out how do I do more games in London and Munich and places like that, because, of course, that works really well for them because then you wake up and you have, you know, breakfast with the NFL. Right. But that's every week, you know, with the Premier League. Right. Right. Is the, you know, the Saturday morning time zone uh, you know, in the East Coast, at least, and a little bit earlier on the West Coast. But yeah, I think that you know, because there's so much in, trist, implicit demand, you know, so what you have to figure out how to do is how do you get direct relationships with your fan bases? Right. right? And how do you do things that you know, are unique and different? But obviously what we have is a, an asset in Chelsea that you know, is in high demand. Right. right? And we can give experiences that you, know, you just can't buy elsewhere. So how do we start to think about you know, how to you know, position um, you know, those opportunities uh, in order to really grow revenue you know, in a world where you know, financial fair play is becoming uh, you know, a, a much more uh, you know, detailed conversation and I think something that you know, the league is committed to uh, in order to try to you know, have a, a more balanced um, you know, competitive slate. Right. And do you think financial fair play is at the place it needs? What, what else needs to happen to ensure that there actually is fair play? Well, it's, it's coming. I mean, yeah. I think you're, you're seeing, uh, you know, a lot of debate about, you know, what percentage of revenue can be spent on the team, and that's happening and, mm -hmm. and you know, likely to, to, to be, you know, voted on in the June uh, Premier League meeting and, uh, you know, finalized. Um, and then there's another concept that, you know, if you think about one is top down and one is bottom up, you know, there's another concept called anchoring, you know, which is saying that, you know, the maximum wages for the team can only be a certain multiple of the, 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 the smallest amount of media money that goes to, you know, the, 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 the 20th Premier League right. team. Right. And so as you look at this portfolio, we only have a couple minutes left, and I could talk to you all afternoon about this, but as you look at your portfolio now, you do have some unbelievable assets. You also have this, you know, massive business and credit, et cetera, that you also have to, that, that I have not asked you anything about because we're talking about sports, um, which is sort of your, your burden and opportunity. Um, this is the life you've chosen. But <laughs> do you see other opportunities in sports? You know, the NFL is, you know, about to open to institutional investors. I imagine you've looked at the NFL before. Are there startup leagues? Are there, are there other things that sort of at least sort of tickle your brain as an opportunity in sports? Oh, I think there's just so many adjacencies. Yeah. I mean, you know, like I was an early investor in DraftKings and, you know, you start to see how, you know, that continues to develop. And, you know, I think, you know, the, the, there's a lot of debate right now going on as to, you know, is, is gambling, you know, good for the game right. or games, you know? And I would argue that there was always gambling and whether it was in the black market or in the legal market, you know, I think it's much better in the legal market. And I think what you've seen this year is, you know, you can see the, the sports radars of the world can see when there's someone crowding a specific bet. Right. Right. So there was a you know, situation with one of the players on one of the NBA teams, you know, where they basically were doing prop bets on how many minutes they were going to play. 
And you know, there was a, you know, a, a, an incident where you know, he basically pulled himself out of the game you know, because he had a contact lens issue. You know, but then Sports Radar basically said, well, why is everyone betting that this no-name player you know, is going to be uh, not playing less than four minutes? I can't remember right. what it was. And they immediately identified it. Yeah. Right. So, you know, I think that because you know, now it's basically like a real market, right, where people see where right. the flows are going. And, you know, so when strange things are happening, you can respond really quickly. Right. So, you know, I think we're just getting started at, you know, how, how that's going to you know, really protect the integrity right. of the game versus, you know, in the old scandals, you know, it was all done in the in the in the black market. Right. Um, I'm going over time just to ask you this one last question. Women's sports came up on the panel previously. It feels like there's investment happening in, at Chelsea specifically on, on the women's side um, in terms of the opportunity there. Is that, is that something you're interested in broadly? I, I learned about that reading about it in okay. the paper. So, you know, it's amazing how many things I learned about reading about. So. But in terms of the opportunity for women's sports, is that something you see in general? Oh, yeah. I mean, obviously, you know, the, the Caitlin Clark phenomenon has been nothing short of just amazing, right? right. The men's Final Four had a lower media audience than the women's Final Four this year. Right. And that was Caitlin Clark, and she played her first game last night and proved that she deserves to be in the WNBA, scored 20 points in her first game. And so, and I think it's just getting started. You're gonna see the, the WNBA continue to grow. Uh, you're gonna see women's soccer, football around the world, the NWSL. Right. You know, Angel City is, is talked about being up for sale. So, you know, I would be shocked if that, you know, doesn't go for at least 200 million. Right. You know, and who would have thought, you know, a year or two years ago, you know, when the Washington Spirit just traded for $33 million or something that you're going to see, you know, the, you know, the, the, the Angel Cities Club trade for 200. Right. And, you know, I think one of the things we believe very much, you know, is that the Chelsea's women team is a top, top women team in the world you know, and is, is going to be worth hundreds of millions of dollars. And we're starting to see sponsors recognize the fact that, you know, they got to get on board. Right. You know, because, uh, you know, it's, a, it's good for their brand. Right. Your gentleman for spending time with me. Thank you so much. Really good to see you. Thank you, Jason. Thanks.